All right, it's great to be here at the Dimensional Studios in Austin, Texas, at the Dimensional headquarters. Really excited because we have Gerard O'Reilly, the co-CEO of Dimensional Fund Advisors. Um, we met where, when back in 2018, um, I think you became the co-CEO 2017. Uh, uh, one of the Dimensional conferences in Singapore. That's right, yeah. that was one yeah. of the first. Yeah. And um, it's been a while now, but uh, I've been to the office a few times now, uh, attending the advanced conference uh, last year in Austin. This year, you guys are holding it in Charlotte, North Carolina. Really yeah. excited. So we're here at the Dimensional Headquarters uh, studio with Gerard, and also uh, we're going to do another one with David Booth. So really excited about that. Yeah, it um, should be fun. Yeah, Welcome. it's going to be fun. We're very happy to have you here. Thank I'm you so you much. I'm glad you can make the trip, because it's a long one. It is a long one. to the advanced conference each year. Uh, it's wonderful to see clients from Singapore and you know you have a presence now in Hong Kong and so on it's great yeah. to see clients from that area of the world great. coming over and, and sharing your time with us yeah that's fantastic and thank you for making time to do this oh, uh, really pleasure. excited about you know by the time this recording goes out I think we'll have you know dimensional funds available in the central provident fund I know we've been working really hard together to get that yeah. um, available so we're really excited that's coming yeah um, and yeah just maybe just opening words uh, maybe Reminiscing about our first meeting in Singapore yeah. um, and how the business has grown for both Dimensional. Uh, you guys have grown tremendously yeah. since then as well, uh, even though you were already quite big. And Endowers was just a fledgling idea and you know it's really grown as well yeah. as a business. So maybe a few words to yeah, the well, audience. First off, welcome to our studios. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to host you here and hopefully make some high quality recordings that you can share with your clients it's and amazing. your staff and yeah. so on. Uh, we got quite lucky with these studios. We finished them just in February 2020, right before COVID wow. lockdowns really began. So we were able to okay. reach a lot of our clients from the studios. Right. I remember uh, the meeting in, in 2018 in, in kind of outside the conference hall. Yep. And you were what, like, what are these jokers? <laughs> no, not what are these jokers. What I remember most about yeah. it was the enthusiasm and the passion and the excitement to want to do something right for investors. You had an idea on how investment advice and uh, investment vehicles could be delivered uh, more efficiently at mm -hmm. better cost with uh, potentially better expected outcomes to the end investor. Mm -hmm. And I remember the level of excitement that was there in order mm -hmm. to bring that to the market. And so it was, it was very cool to see and very kind of inspirational in that Here's a market that can really stand to benefit yeah. from some of these ideas that have been around in the U.S., been around in the U.K., mm -hmm. been around in Australia and other parts of the world, uh, but hadn't yet been brought really to different markets in Asia. And so that was wonderful to see. I remember that meeting very well. Mm -hmm. And what's been really cool to witness is the success that you've had uh, in the years since then, despite the world being kind of tumultuous, it's yeah. been it's been a lot of success. So that's uh, well well done on that. That's uh, congratulations. It's well, a thank you job so well much. done so far. And we couldn't have done it without you guys because when we began, as most people know, Dimensional was our core fund management partner. Um, I think we had a massive alignment in terms of you know the philosophy, mm -hmm. the process, how we see the world of investing, yeah. and how we should invest because there is a right way to invest and there are better ways to invest and I think Dimensional exemplifies that um, and we were so excited to partner with Dimensional from the get-go um, and we've continued to grow the business together um, and we're really excited about the next phase of growth uh, because I think there is a broader audience that needs Dimensional products, a systematic kind of you know, evidence-based way of investing um, and we need to introduce that to a broader audience in Singapore, but also very excited that we're going to Hong Kong as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to make the dimensional funds available to the, you know, the client base in Hong Kong too. Yeah, I think there was also good alignment on client first. Yeah, that if you sit on the same side of your table, a table as your clients, mm -hmm. that everybody has a better experience. That's right. And so it's with the right investments, the right client support, mm -hmm. and the right focus on kind of that fiduciary aspect yeah. and trying to do well for your clients. Mm. I think there was a, a strong sense of alignment on both. That's right. And I think that's what's made the relationship a, as strong as it has been over the yeah. past number of years. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Maybe we can just 
dive right in and you know maybe a quick intro to people that may be less familiar with dimensional mm -hmm. uh, less familiar about you know the process of systematic investing mm -hmm. um, and factor-based investing uh, the dimensions of investments and so maybe a quick intro about you know how dimensional invests and why it's so important to focus on the scientific systematic evidence-based way of investing to improve the outcome or the probability of outcome yeah, yeah. And maybe I'll, I'll take kind of a step back in time, yeah. give a little bit of the history of the firm, and I'm sure you'll hear some of this from David Booth yeah. when uh, you two chat uh, as well. Uh, so when you look at the people who started Dimensional, David Booth, Rex Ingfield, others, mm -hmm. uh, they were very much involved in the early days of indexing in the mm -hmm. 70s. And when it came to start Dimensional, there was real a need identified in the marketplace, which was can we give institutional investors diversified access to small cap stocks? And that need was identified, and then how do you go about doing it in the best way possible? Mm. And indexing, too rigid, yeah. and so started off with, well, diversification is good, low cost is good, transparency is good, mm -hmm. so there are some of the good things from indexing. Uh, but the rigidity of indexing leaves too much money on the table. So can you come with mm. a rules-based approach such that you can communicate what to expect from the approach and that allows financial professionals to monitor the outcomes uh, but deliver it in such a way uh, that you can add value and capture the returns that the market has mm. to offer. Mm. Because my view on markets is that they're willing to pay you your fair share of the returns for the risks that you're willing to bear but if you do it poorly you'll get far less yeah. and that can make a difference in the long pull. So we started off with a set of small cap strategies, fixed mm -hmm. income was sh added shortly thereafter, value strategies added, core strategies added, global fixed income added, mm -hmm. so lots of different strategies over time. But there's a few things that are true then and are, are true now. One is this notion of a rules-based approach is the right approach with, the, with innovation, you have yep. to have good innovation, you have to have the right support mm -hmm. so that you can communicate what to expect and then deliver on that, those expectations and the right pricing. And that's true then and, and, it's, and it's true now. Yeah. And when you look at that innovation over time, the connections with the academic community, uh, uh, of which there are many, uh, Dimensional has been associated with many Nobel Prize winners over time. Uh, I think that that's part of the innovation and how you, how you drive it forward. So that's kind of Dimensional from the early days, mm -hmm. what's kind of held constant. And uh, I think that what we've been able to deliver are these rules-based systematic approaches that go well beyond indexing, that can capture the higher expected returning areas of the markets in ways that are very efficient for clients. We can get into the details of yep. that, yeah. but that's what I think that we've been able to accomplish on behalf of clients over 42 years now. So we've yep. been doing it for some time. It's fantastic. A lot of investors in Asia have been like bought into the whole Jack Bogle, Vanguard kind of mm -hmm. Passive index investing is the best way. Warren Buffett, you know, supports it. Um, but when we say passive index investing, um, you know, it's not often passive, first of all. Um, and secondly, it's like a market cap based indexing, right, that human beings do with a limited number of stocks. Oftentimes it's S&P 500, just 500 stocks in the US, mm -hmm. right? It's an index. Everybody thinks, oh, it's a passive index investing strategy, but it really isn't. So, you know, maybe we can like help the audience understand the difference between a market cap based investing um, through a passive index fund and the dimensional way, which yeah. is a much more sophisticated and scientific based way yeah. of investing. The way that we often frame it here at Dimensional is that indexing improved on traditional active management mm -hmm. and dimensional improved on indexing. That's right, yeah. And so I think there's a lot of good things like mm -hmm. transparency, low cost, diversification that you can get with indexing. Mm. But the rigidity, I think, is a problem. And the rigidity comes in a few different ways. So you mentioned uh, market cap weighting. Market cap weighting by itself is a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. But if you want higher than market expected returns, then you're going to have to do something different than the market. And the question is, how do you do that in a systematic way? So let's take a step back and say, why might you want to do that? Mm. Well, if you look at the return of markets around the world historically, they've been about 10% a year. And 10% is an explosive number, is the way we describe it, because at a 10% compound rate of return, your money doubles every seven years. But we've talked a little bit about size, value, profitability premiums. We can get into that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But they are economically meaningful. 
and they're reliable in terms of, if you look at the historical data, they happen by way more than just chance. Yeah. They can take that turn and turn it into an 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an even more explosive number because your d money doubles every six years. Yeah. So after about 42 years, you have double the amount of money. Mm -hmm. And accumulation phases for investors are often 30 to 40 years. Yeah. So this is a very important decision for investors to make. Yeah. They have a long horizon. You can do something that has low turnover, it's low cost, it's well diversified, mm -hmm. but it puts you in a position to have an 11 or 12 percent compound return versus a 10, which means puts you in a position to have double the amount uh, of mm -hmm. growth uh, by the time you hit retirement. Yeah. And so we think that that's a, a avenue worth pursuing for clients, in particular when you work with financial professionals like yourselves, yeah. uh, because those are meaningful differences mm. in returns that can lead to meaningful differences in, in wealth over time. Yeah. The other rigidity aspects are probably maybe a little bit too technical, but I'll give you an example. Yeah. You mentioned the S&P 500. And you can get an index fund with the S&P 500 at reasonably low cost. Mm -hmm. In December 2020, very interesting example, Tesla, everybody knows the company, was added to the <laughs> S&P 500. Remember that. And what happens when a stock is added to an index or deleted from an index is index managers typically add it mm -hmm. when the index adds it or deletes it when the index deletes it. Yeah. So what you see is a lot of price pressure. Mm -hmm. So because everybody wants to buy it, the price goes up temporarily and comes down. Yeah. If everybody wants to sell it, the price goes down and then comes up. If you look at what that costs indices, you can do a pretty reasonable yeah. estimate for Tesla in December 2020, mm -hmm. it cost the S&P 500 between five and 10 basis points. Yeah. That means it cost those investors between five and 10 basis points. So when you look at that relative to the management fee, in one month, yep. what is often a management fee for that type of an index was spent in adding one stock to the index. Yep. The annual That's fee, the lack of annual fee. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these guys. An annual fee spent in about a month. Yep. And so we think there's no need to do that. There's no need to be so rigid. And there's no need to incur on uh, necessary costs when you're investing. So uh, I think that indexing is an improvement on traditional active, but there's a lot better that you can do. And if you're disciplined, you can end up with a lot more wealth by pursuing that approach over time. Yeah. And we think that's an approach worth, uh, worth understanding and then worth assessing if it's right for you. This is a time to take a step back and talk about um, the dimensions of investing, yeah. you know, the proven factors. Yeah. Um, I think you did a fantastic job of not mentioning it in detail and going technical, but maybe it's time for us to get a bit technical a and a bit deeper here. Um, dimensional uses only the proven factors of returns, yeah. like scientifically proven, yeah. um, and you maybe use five out of the six that have yeah. been proven so far. But there's 400, 500 like factors that people talk yeah. about out there that have not necessarily been proven or cannot be implemented. Um, so it'd be great if you could like maybe give us a lay of the lands of what 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 are these like you know why there's so many factors out there yeah and why does dimensional only choose the ones that are very few yeah um, and how do you do that yeah so let let's take a step back yeah. then and talk about expected returns mm -hmm. and I think that if you ask any investor if all stocks have the same expected return or all bonds have the same expected return, yeah. they'll invariably say no. Yeah. And that's kind of a statement that market participants or investors require different returns yeah. to hold different investments. Some they may perceive as more risky and therefore require a yeah. higher return, a stock versus a bond versus yeah. a, as an example. And so there's differences in expected returns across stocks and bonds. I think most people will agree with that statement. Based on the risk that Based on risk or based on preferences, it can be based on, I think the exact reasons about why mm -hmm. investors mm -hmm. require differences in expected returns yeah. to hold different securities, I don't think is completely nailed down. Yeah. But the fact that they do, I think is kind of universally accepted. Yeah, accepted. Then the question you ask yourselves is if people demand differences in returns to hold different stocks or different bonds, what are the ways that you can identify that in a mm -hmm. well diversified portfolio? And there's two obvious ways. One is, well, if you're paying a lower price for something, mm -hmm. that means that there's a higher discount rate applied to future cash flows. Yep. And so discount rate equals your expected return. Mm -hmm. And so lower price is usually related to higher expected returns. And the second is if you expect to receive higher cash flows in the future, 
for that lower price, mm -hmm. higher discount rate. Yeah. So higher expected future cash flows to investors, uh, higher, higher expected returns. So those things are, are very much universally accepted, I would mm -hmm. say. So when we look at the various different research and factors and all that sort of uh, uh, items out there, there's a few criteria that we apply. First off, does it fit into that valuation framework of the world? Mm -hmm. So when you think about company size, you think about value, basically you're taking the price and you're normalizing it by something. Mm -hmm. If I multiply price by shares outstanding, it, let me, it lets me compare the price of two companies. If I have company A and it's trading at $100 a share and company B is trading at $100 a share, I say, mm, the price is the same, how do I compare them? Well, if company A has 100 shares outstanding, mm -hmm. for $100 I buy 1% of the company or the equity in the company. Yeah. If company B has 1,000 shares outstanding, I buy 0.1% for $100. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I multiply by shares outstanding, it gives me an idea how to compare prices. I can also take that $100 and divide it by book value or earnings or sales or something like that. It lets me compare prices. Mm. So the way that we think about company size and, and uh, value relative prices, a way to compare the mm. prices that people are paying. When you look at profitability, it fits neatly into that valuation framework of the world, which is profitability predicts future profitability. Yeah. And you say, well, how, how, how could that be? The analogy that I often use is tall parents have tall kids. <laughs> Profitability is an intrinsic firm characteristic. Yeah. Well-run firms tend to remain well-run for some period of time. Yeah. And so profitability gives you information about future profitability, but more specifically, the firms that have the highest profitability, profit scale by book or assets, mm -hmm. tend to have the highest profitability going forward. Not forever, but for a number of years. Yeah. When you look at asset growth, that's similar. It tells you something about cash flows to investors. So now you have two things that tell you about price, mm -hmm. and two things profits and investment that tell you something about cash flows to investors. Yeah. So just intuitively, you expect them to be related or have information about differences in returns across a broadly diversified group of stocks. And that's exactly what you find in the historical data. So item number one is does it make sense? A valuation framework of the world says, well, prices today are discounted future cash flows so if I can say something about cash flows and prices, I'm saying something about discount rate, that's my expected return. That's a sensible story. Item two is do you see it in the data? Is it reliably different, so it happened by more than just chance? And is it economically meaningful, something worth pursuing? And that then is a second set of experiments that we would run here. We have a 100 person plus research staff with lots of data, more data than most academics have. Uh, more resources so than you actually provide the data have. to the academics. We That's provide much, some yeah. data to academics yeah. over time, yes. And we work with a lot of academics that help us give great insights into the data. And we then are able to test if it's reliable, so it happened by more than chance, mm -hmm. and if it's economically meaningful. So that's second set of test number two. Then the third thing is, is it implementable? Do we see this broadly across stocks so we can build diversified strategies around it? Do we think that we can end up with low enough turnover so that we can build a set of strategies that aren't incurring too much costs to transact? And if the answer to that question is yes, okay, now we have something. Mm. The fourth question is, is it really new? You see lots of new things in the literature, yeah. but when you test them in the context of what you already know, they're not actually new. So if you test a new observation in the context of, I know about company size, smaller mm. stocks have outperformed larger stocks. Value, lower relative price stocks have outperformed growth or high relative price stocks over time. High profitability, high profitability stocks have outperformed low profitability stocks. Mm -hmm. Asset growth, firms that have grown their assets a lot underperform firms that haven't grown their assets by a lot. Right? These are things we see in the data. Mm -hmm. So if something new comes along, say, I know these things, mm -hmm. so let me test it in the context of what I already know. Yeah. And uh, when you go through that process, you end up with something that in our view is very robust. Mm -hmm you don't want to be in the business of saying you're sorry. Oops, I got that wrong. Yeah. You want to have very robust, reliable research that you can implement strategies well mm -hmm. so that you minimize unnecessary costs, minimize unnecessary turnover, have diversification. So all of those good things about an index you preserve, but you put yourself in a position for 1% or 2% higher returns each year. Yep. And we hold ourselves to a very high standard when mm -hmm. we're doing that research. Yep. Everything that comes along is not worth adopting. We like to say, don't confuse activity with accomplishment. 
And I think a lot of people do that. They say that if you're active, it must mean that you're accomplishing something. Yeah. And our view is mm, often steady is a better approach and being high confident, yeah. confidence that something is true and it should be expected going forward mm -hmm. uh, is a better approach for clients. You know, especially in a high interest rate environment or in a bear market or a bull market, people get shaken because sometimes these factors don't always give us short term returns. So maybe touch upon the time frame in which, you know, each of these factors or combined together in a dimensional portfolio, um, what is the kind of time frame that we should be looking at to really yeah. uh, achieve those proven um, and persistent returns? Yeah. yeah. I think the first uh, important lesson in, in kind of understanding that is mm -hmm. what do market prices represent? Mm -hmm. And market prices represent forecasts of the future. They're predictions of yeah. the future. They're informed by the past, but they're looking to the future. That's right. When you think of market prices in that way, new information comes along, causes people to reassess the risks, reassess the expected mm -hmm. cash flows and so on of each investment opportunity, and that changes market prices. But let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think any of your investors sign up to a risky investment to get a negative expected return? No. No. <laughs> no. So when market prices change each day, they're changing to keep expected returns positive. That's right. And if you dig down a little bit higher, there's also changing to keep value premiums defined in the right way, profit mm -hmm. premiums and so on, positive. So every single day, we expect low price stocks with high expected cash yeah. flows to outperform high price stocks with low expected cash flows. Mm -hmm. That's every single day. But what happens sometimes is you get news that can be good for one set of stocks and mm -hmm. bad for another set of stocks, or good for the overall market or bad for the overall market. And so that means that you get a lot of volatility around that yeah. expected average. If you flip a coin, probably on a daily basis, it's 50-50 about whether you have a positive return in the market or a negative mm -hmm. return in the market. And that's what you see historically. If you look at daily returns, yeah. it's about 50-50. When you spread it out to annual, so at the year mark, oh, well, then you're at 55, 60% of the year's are 12 month uh, rolling returns where you've had positive returns in mm -hmm. the market. If you go out to five years, the uh, frequency goes up. 10 years, the frequency goes up. Mm -hmm. 20 years, the frequency goes up. And so the way that you think about size, value, profitability premiums and equity premiums and uh, asset growth investment premiums is that you have to be ev there every day to improve your chance of getting them because you never know when they're going to be positive. Yep. The probability of them being positive uh, increases the longer the investment horizon and the uh, probabilities get quite high as you go out to 10, 20, 30 years, but they never go perfectly to one. Mm. And I think that's important in two aspects. The risk of investing in equities never goes to zero, regardless of the investment horizon. And people have to understand that, because if it ever did, that would mean it's, it's a sure returns. thing, and therefore the returns would go away. Yeah. So the risk never goes to zero. But also, just because the probability of having a positive return goes up, also the dispersion of your ending wealth goes up. And depending on how you view risk, that means that the uncertainty of outcomes over the long pull also increases mm -hmm. with the longer horizon. Uh, so there's never a guarantee, but our view is that if you're investing and you have the right goals in mind, the right asset allocation in mind, regardless of if you're going to be investing for a year, if you're investing only for a year, you might have way more in fixed income than stocks. If you're investing for a longer horizon and you have future human capital to draw from, you might have a lot more stock than fixed mm -hmm. income. If you have the right asset allocation, in our view, this is the right approach in terms of increasing your expected returns. Mm -hmm. The probability goes up over time, uh, but whether you're there for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, it's mm -hmm. a good approach. Right. So I, I always talk about it in that fashion, that if you're only investing for a year, you think that your investment horizon is a year, then fix the asset allocation first, but mm. you can still pursue size value profitability premiums. It doesn't matter if you're there for a year or 10 years or 30 years, uh, but you just have to understand the overall asset allocation and what your goals are. Right. So just, just following up on that, Gerard, um, maybe you know, a lot of investors are worried about the environment that we're in right now. I mean, it could be a bear market, it could be you know, a low interest rate environment. Right now, it happens to be a high interest environment. 
and a lot of worries about recession. Uh, markets, uh, you know, you know, a bear market, but now we're like bouncing back. Um, how important is the macro environment and the underlying kind of levers of where the market is uh, when we're investing in these proven factors? Yeah. So the market environment clearly will drive market mm. returns. Yeah. That is important. The question that you should ask yourself as an investor is what do you know that nobody else knows that may be incorporated in the prices soon or in the yeah. future? So if everybody is worried about a recession, mm -hmm. well, why do you think that's not already embedded in the market's expectation of what's going to happen in the real economy? I think that's a very important thing to keep mm. in mind because you don't actually know exactly what's built into the market's expectation. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose that everybody expects a recession. And so what's built into the prices in the market mm -hmm. today is a recession next year. That's what's built in already today. Mm. Now, we already established that people don't sign up for negative expected returns. Yeah. And so this expectation is already built into prices. So prices have already lowered themselves enough mm -hmm. such that expected returns are positive. Suppose the world unfolds exactly as people expect. Then you should get the expected return that was built in, which is positive. Mm -hmm. So you have the recession that everybody expects. You get a positive return from the stock market because it already was built into the price. Mm -hmm. Suppose something a little better than expected happens, you get an even more positive return. Suppose the recession is much worse than people expect, then you might get a negative return. Yeah. And so the, the way to think about it is prices are predicting the future, they're looking mm -hmm. to the future, they reflect the aggregate expectation of investors. Mm -hmm. So when investors are very bullish, that's the expectation they reflect. When they're very bearish, that's the expectation that they reflect. And they set such to keep expected returns positive, so mm. that for the risks that people are signing up for, the expected outcome is positive. It doesn't mean the realized outcome will always be positive, but the expected outcome mm. is positive. So that means regardless of what environment you're in, mm -hmm. and we've done a lot of research looking at this. We've done lots of research looking for decades, at yeah. uh, you know, high interest rate environments, low interest rate environments, mm -hmm. changing interest rate environments. We've done research on uh, you know, GDP growth and how that can be used to help you understand future stock market returns. Uh, we've looked at stock market returns through the economic cycle. We've done a lot of work on this. Mm. And overwhelmingly, when we look at that work in totality, we think that investors are far better off staying the course mm -hmm. with their investment portfolio and staying disciplined regardless of what they might be hearing about the macro economy. Now, some investors like to take activity, mm -hmm. let's not confuse it with accomplishment, if you really think that there's a recession coming that's going to hit the real economy, mm -hmm. you can change your activity. You can save more. You can yeah. choose to consume a little less. And that doesn't mean that you're doing nothing. It means that you're doing something that will actually help you over the long pull, mm -hmm. but you don't need to change necessarily your investment portfolio yeah. because that's unlikely to help you uh, over the long pull yeah. if you're making changes in the face of, yeah. I think a recession is coming. Because by the time you think that, everybody else has already thought that it's in the price of the stocks and bonds and how they're trading. And it might not even come. And it may not <laughs> even come. I think that one of the things that we talk about is you know, proven and persistent factors, but there are some new factors that Dimensional has introduced over time. And mm -hmm. you know, um, the ones that we know really well and have been advertised a lot, I guess, um, through people like us and um, liter in, lit in dimensional literature is, you know, the size, the value, the quality, which is very well known. But you have some other factors. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can introduce them to the audience, but also how do you bring those into the fold and how do you implement that uh, in the portfolios yeah. of dimensional? Yeah. One thing that is important to keep in mind when you're investing is opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. And that's the cost of the yeah. path that you didn't take. You can always choose to invest in a broad market index and that's one path you can take. So you want to measure yourself versus that path. You're mm -hmm. trying to do better. You're trying to take that 10% and turn it into an 11 or 12. You're trying to do better, but that 10 uh, was on the table for you to choose in, 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 in a kind of a reasonable fashion. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way that we often think about designing portfolios. So size, value, profitability, they drive the strategic asset allocation of a portfolio. And that's in part because you expect to see it in the historical data, you mm -hmm. see it by more than just chance in the historical data, they're economically meaningful, they can really uh, you know, 
put you in a good position to take that 10 and turn it into an 11 or 12, which means your money doubles from seven yeah. years to doubling every six years, and yeah. that's a big deal. Okay, it's huge. but they have low turnover. You can implement them with broad diversification. Mm -hmm. You can keep the costs well under control. And so our view is, let's suppose for the next 20 or 30 years, small cap stocks have the same return as large, value the same return as growth, and high profitability the same return as low profitability. Mm -hmm. We want to end up with the market. Yep. So we were going for 11 or 12, but if 10 mm -hmm. was what was on the table, and size, value, and profitability premiums don't materialize, we want to end with 10. Yep. And so that's an important criteria for setting the strategic asset allocation. Mm -hmm. But then how do you accomplish that strategic allocation over time? Well, the path that you take to get there matters. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. A value strategy has about a 20, 25% turnover. So when you buy a stock based on value, you expect to hold it for you know four or five years. Let's talk about momentum. Momentum is the tendency of stocks that have outperformed the market over the past three to 12 months yep. to continue to outperform over the next few months. And stocks that have underperformed, they continue to underperform. Yep. But it's a much shorter effect. Mm -hmm. So you, if you're in upward momentum, so you've outperformed over the past mm -hmm. three to 12 months today, you might be in upward momentum for the next two to three months. So you can end up with 100 or 200% turnover. You're holding the stocks for a very yeah. short period of time. In our view, you're taking too big a bet. That's just too much turnover, too much potential mm -hmm. costs incurred. Let's not do that. And so our view is, okay, we want to get to a size, value, profitability, strategic asset allocation, mm. but we have money come in every day, corporate actions every day, stocks move around, and sometimes a value stock becomes a growth stock, and sometimes a small cap stock becomes a large cap stock. And yep. uh, So how do you decide when to buy and when to sell? What's your buy, hold, sell discipline? Mm -hmm. And so how we would use that type of, of information is we say, well, if a stock is in upward momentum, let's not sell as much of it yeah. so that we get an overweight to upward momentum without trading to get that overweight. Mm -hmm. Or if a stock is in downward momentum, let's not buy so much of it today. Yeah. We can do that for two reasons. One, the strategic asset allocation has very low turnover. So you can take your time mm -hmm. over a period of months, mm -hmm. work your way into the allocation. And two, we look every single day. Indexing looks once a year, twice a year, four times a year. Mm. We look to do a little bit of portfolio turnover every day. So small adjustments each day, yep. which means you can consider many more things about mm. a stock so that when you buy a stock or sell a stock, you're confident that it has the right expected return profile over the next day, month, m many years. Mm. And we think the path that you take to get to that asset allocation can actually add value. And that's what we've demonstrated over time. So when you look at the other things like s size, value, quality, or profitability, lots of folks have heard of those. Mm. Momentum we incorporate into our strategies, and people have often heard, heard mm. of that. Asset growth or investments, yep. uh, we incorporate that into our strategies in, in how, we, how we manage money. People often hear of short interest mm. as a way, and the way that we incorporate that is you get information from what people are willing to borrow Yep. a stock at, stock lending. A, a stock lending that tells yep. you something over the very short term, we incorporate that. Mm. We incorporate all those more as a way to say, how do I get to the strategic asset allocation, yep. the path that I take to get there, so that I can enhance value, add returns as I get there, yep. without incurring costs yep. uh, associated with them. So we look at probably, you know, on any given day, on the order of 10 different characteristics mm -hmm. that are informed by different mm -hmm. types of factor research, but we're using them in a way that puts us in the best position mm. to capture those long-term returns of size, value, profitability, but give you an enhanced ride or make sure that you're, you're not taking unnecessary bets yep. against other premiums that have been identified in mm -hmm. the academic literature. Uh, in order to pursue these and add yeah. a little bit of those without incurring the costs. Yeah. I really want to thank you, Gerard, for joining us today and um, hosting us at these wonderful studios. Um, I hope that maybe we can do other sessions where we go a bit deeper since it's the first session. Um, so thank you again. Fantastic. Thank you and looking forward to uh, doing sessions with you again in the future. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.